Today on Secular, FBI Director Chris Ray is slammed in a congressional hearing told by members of Congress, I don't trust you to protect us. Keeping you informed and engaged, now more than ever. This is Seculo. We want to hear from you. Share and post your comments or call 1-800-684-3110. And now your host, Jordan Seculo. All right, welcome to Seculo. We are taking your calls on this Friday, 1-800-684-3110. You know there's a lot going on in Washington, D.C., on FISA, on security, on what's happening, even securing inside the United States. And the FBI Director Christopher Wray, uh, you know, going before committees uh, and is getting blasted by uh, members of Congress as well when he does go before those committees about how they have handled uh, the FBI, the policies of the FBI, to the point, Logan, where we've got members of Congress, and we'll play it yeah, we uh, for people. It. Can we play it first? This is Congressman Mike Garcia. And, and they're being very direct with how they feel about Christopher Ray when he testifies to them. Take a listen. I'll be honest with you, and, and this pains me to say this, but I don't trust you. Um, I, I don't think that this is necessarily a funding problem that we have for your for your agency as, as much as a leadership problem. And between the, the lack of transparency in hearings like this and in intel hearings, your, your weaponization and politicization of issues and instruments of national security against innocent Americans and against institutions like churches and the fact that you have held no one truly accountable for prior FISA abuses that we have all seen and recognized. I think you yourself have acknowledged that there's been abuses. I mean, so there you go, Logan. At the same time, you know, FISA is at the the House of Representatives right now and specifically the reauthorization. We're going to th- go through when we get back from the break what six amendments? One already got through some changes. Now, a lot of us have talked about the fact that Pfizer and Logan needs to be completely uh, tossed out. And I think most of our supporters believe that. At the same time, we don't have the votes to do that right now. Uh, and there should be some replacements. So you got to have that ready to, to go as well. But here's the big issue, right? Can we get these six amendments through and then understand that? So what we can do now is incrementally put in some safeguards. And, I mean, that that's the key, and our team in D.C. is working on it really hard. Yeah, absolutely. And we will be taking your calls coming up in a few segments, 1-800-684-3110. I'm going to encourage you to call, get on hold. Next segment, though, we got Rick Rennell joining us. We're going to break down all of this as well with him, obviously someone who knows a little bit about how things work behind the scenes. Yeah, exactly. So, folks, we want you to support the work of the ACLJ at aclj.org. Yep. Uh, and, and just to, again, focus in on... Uh, the fact that you've now have got members of Congress, Logan, I mean, that are being that direct to say, you know what, we don't trust you anymore. Yeah. We don't believe you. I don't trust you. You know, I think that's the first thing he said. I'll be honest with you, and this pains me to say it, but I don't trust you. That is where we are at in society, but that's why you said the work of the ACLJ continues, and we're just three days. I'm sure you want me, you want me to say this. We're three days from tax day, everybody. Yeah. April 15th, uh, your tax filing deadline, and right now we are battling the taxpayer-funded deep state, as you've heard here, in multiple cases. See, we tied it all in. But today, you have an opportunity to make a tax-deductible donation to the ACLJ. A gift to us will be doubled as we defend life and liberty, and you will determine our fight. Right now, our legal teams are battling, like we said, the deep state, the FBI, and multiple FOIA lawsuits after the FBI targeted parents as terrorists, placed spies in churches, and abused FISA to spy on Americans. And we're also defending brave FBI whistleblowers. You've heard from them this week in federal appeals courts who are exposing FBI deep state corruption. And we can't do it without your support. we got to be able to battle back in court, Jordan. Yeah, I mean, get get this. We've got right now a six FOIA active uh, situations. Five of those are in litigation. So, I mean, they're they're heading to court. Uh, One, we're still waiting to see if they comply. So that's just to the FBI as part of our FOIA practice to protect your constitutional rights as an American citizen. So if you are concerned, as that member of Congress, as we are, that you can no longer trust the FBI, this is a great time to support our work because, again, we are standing up and getting the information and pointing out the problems inside. Go to aclj.org. Be part of our life and liberty drive. Double the impact of that donation. aclj.org. We're back. You don't want to miss Rick Rennell to break it all down for us. 
House once again failed to advance legislation to reauthorize a program intelligence officials say is crucial to American national security. The Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, or FISA, is set to expire April 19th if Congress doesn't move quickly. The act gives U.S. intelligence the power to collect information and communications from foreign adversaries who are outside of the U.S. A small group of Republicans blocked the legislation from moving forward Thursday over concerns it doesn't go far enough to protect against collecting intelligence on U.S. citizens. What we found is uh, federal agencies are buying data that would otherwise require a warrant or subpoena. So they're basically avoiding having to get a warrant in the first place. So one of the key things for the FISA reform is getting it to the point where you have to get a warrant if you want to search American citizens' data. The FBI director went to Capitol Hill to urge lawmakers to renew the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act after Donald Trump called on them to kill it. We've seen a rogues gallery of foreign terrorist organizations calling for attacks on us. Now is not the time to take away tools that we need to punch back. It would be dangerous and put Americans' lives at risk. This legislation, as you referenced, uh, that rule, a previous rule, was tanked earlier in the week by uh, 19 House Republicans who, again, were concerned about the legislation moving forward. Uh, but there have been some tweaks made to uh, the legislation, again, to perhaps uh, sunset this reauthorization in two years instead of five years, which as of now seems to be satisfying some House conservatives. We caught up with Texas Congressman Chip Roy a short time ago. Take a listen to what he told us. We're, we're all working in good faith to try to do it. The two-year uh, time frame is a much better landing spot because it gives us two years to see is any of this working rather than kicking it out five years. They say these reforms are going to work. Well, I guess we'll find out. Sec Hill, we are taking your calls to 1-800-684-3110. That's 1-800-684-3110. We are, of course, talking about uh, the, a big debate going on right now in Congress right now about our national security and, and a part of our national security that we know has been so abused against American citizens and specifically uh, you know, targeting uh, President Trump, the Trump campaign, those associated with President Trump, instead of you know actual terrorist and, and dangerous foreign actors. It's great to be joined by our uh, senior advisor for uh, foreign policy and uh, uh, national security, the former uh, director of national intelligence, uh, Rick Rennell. Because, Rick, we heard in a congressional hearing yesterday straight up from Congressman Mike Garcia that he just told you know the FBI director, Christopher Wray, we don't trust you anymore when you come and testify. We don't trust that you're focusing on the right issues, that you're you're focusing on putting agents in churches, uh, but you're, you're not, uh, again, dealing with the actual threats uh, that America faces. And so a lot of this was on uh, Section 702, the, the wiretapping, and, of course, the FISA court, uh, and how many reforms should be done. There was a whole list of uh, almost 60. It's now down to six. A couple have gotten through so far in the House. Uh, but, you know, we've been those kind of part of those advocates that say it may be one like the IRS that we believe could be beyond self-correction, Rick. And I, I kind of wanted your thoughts on that. Could, do you think FISA can be fixed? Through amendment processes, or do you think it needs to be uh, kind of kind of thrown out the door and something else to replace it needs to be ready to go? I think that will serve a purpose, but with much more you know safeguards on the rails. Yeah, well, first of all, let's just start from every single uh, person that I know wants to make sure that we're stopping terrorism and that we're using all of the tools of the federal government. But the 702 FISA is not the only tool. And, and shame on anyone who pretends like this is the only tool that we have. This is one of the tools, but it's one of the tools that's being abused. And I can tell you unequivocally that what Congress writes into a law, the intel community manipulates and uh, abuses, uh, I should say some in the intel community manipulate and abuse uh, their power. And that's what we're trying to solve for. How do you get the tool without allowing there to be an abuse. And the, the abuse is, is that uh, individuals who are gathering intelligence are allowed to listen in on Americans if their uh, strategy was to listen in on a foreigner. 
And so they have been able to manipulate this process to say, oh, I'm really going after a foreigner. But they're listening to a U.S. official. And by the way, Jordan, these U.S. officials sometimes are members of Congress. Members of Congress need to be much smarter about what's being, what's happening. I have been a part of the arguments inside the intel community where I've had to push back on how they clarif- classify that U.S. official who may happen to be a member of Congress so that they don't give away a description that uh, everyone would then know exactly who they're talking to, who got uh, wrapped up into this uh, this conversation. And so the abuse is real. And for anyone to just look at a piece of paper and say, oh, no, we've got a, a way to get around this. I see it on paper. They don't understand the actual practice versus the academic exercise of writing a bill in Congress. I mean, right now, there's a vote going on in the House as we speak, Rick. It's, they're actually taking uh, the actual vote. Uh, one of the six changes that we just talked about did go through on a voice vote that prohibits the resumption of these, they call it, quote, abouts collection under Section 702. That's like, hey, we want to learn about something. We don't really have any direct evidence, but give us some power courts so we can go on like a, a fishing expedition. That has that amendment passed by voice vote. I think that's a good change there. Uh, but the warrant provision, again, there's been a lot of criticism. The warrant provision, Rick, just to make clear to everybody, just requires uh, uh, the DOJ working with FBI to go put forward this warrant to the judge. And the judge then says, okay, there's enough info here to move forward. Uh, you don't have, right now, you don't have to do that. And they were trying to say, well, this this changes everything and it slows us down. I think that could happen in minutes. It usually does very quickly in the FISA court. But what it does, and, and it still would not identify, It's not. some people get confused on this, the warrant isn't going to be public. So it's still going to be very private. The person who the the warrant is targeting or persons uh, are not going to be notified of this. Look, my my problem is is that what's written on paper and talked about in front of a judge to say, uh, you know, we want to go after this foreigner. Uh, that's all well and good. Uh, I, I'm actually extremely supportive of all the tools to figure out how do we collect enough information to figure out who the bad actors are. The problem is, is that the person who's implementing this is allowed to use their political bias to uh, bump or entice or listen in on, quote unquote, a foreigner who they know a U.S. official is talking to. And so the 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 idea on paper that I'm going to listen to a foreigner is all gone because the, the motive is to listen to a U.S. official. If you think I'm crazy, you don't understand the process. I have been a, a part of this too much to see that this happens way too many times. And pulling that individual, that bad actor back within the intelligence community, I get is a very difficult thing. It is, it is near impossible. But I do think that there are some ways to mitigate this. There are ways to minimize uh, what's happening. More transparency once you get the approval on the actual process. That's what I'm focused on is the transparency and the checking of the person who's actually now implementing the strategy that was asked uh, the, the judge to approve. Let's go to the phones. We've got a lot of questions related to this topic, Rick. Let's go to Bill, who's calling in Wyoming, watching on ACLJ.org. Great place to do it. We'll tell you why. Coming up here in just a second, but Bill in Wyoming, you're on the air. Yeah, thanks for taking my call. I think what needs to be done is uh, Christopher Ray be told, look, all this uh, time is spending on American citizens and officials is actually cost money. And if you wouldn't be doing that, you wouldn't have to be worrying about getting more funds. Well, I think, you know, Rick, I would, again, this idea of spending more money on Americans' political opponents, uh, the idea here, Rick, and this is what I actually kind of wanted to ask you about and take this call. Do you believe in this presidential election that enough safeguards have been put in place with the FBI – has uh, been shamed enough publicly that they would not try to do what they did to President Trump in the first election? I think we've done a good job of showing the abuses and the bad actors within the FBI, but they haven't made any changes or any adjustments. What For anyone to believe that somehow it's not going to happen again, you have to believe that the shaming of Christopher Wray worked. 
and that somehow he then went to his deputies and pulled back. I don't believe that. I think Christopher Wray has lost credibility. Uh, I was a big advocate for getting rid of him in the Trump administration. I don't believe that Chris Wray and his placed political deputies and leadership have demonstrated that they uh, are, are willing to be nonpartisan. I think they are partisan. They've burned their credibility. They need to be removed. And we need to bring people in who are uh, much more committed to making sure that the FBI is used to protect Americans, not go after Americans that they just disagree with politically. That ties exactly into what I want to ask you about next, which is, um, I, again, because those changes haven't been made, even though some of these small changes may be made, uh, these six amendments, uh, that's not really going to slow the FBI down too much on, again, when it comes to trying to get at potentially political candidates. We'll see if that even gets through the final you know, vote. We don't even know if that's going to happen yet. So, uh, But with the potential for that abuse, even in this election, I think, Rick, it just underscores uh, the importance of the work of the ACLJ right now in this moment because we have to be prepared now that the FBI is planning some new crossfire razor, crossfire hurricane uh, to uh, uh, damage uh, President Trump, and it could come at any moment. Usually it's later in the campaign cycle, and they've got him stuck, you know, of course, the lawfare they're using against him in court. So it's like a, a dual-edged sword coming from DOJ and FBI. But the ACLJ is here uh, to point it out, protect it, and fight back, and, of course, work with the members of Congress to make sure we can get – as many reforms in as possible and call the bad actors inside these agencies to the committees and call them out. One of the reasons I love being a part of the ACLJ is because it's a substantive conversation about the issues. We're not just an organization that, that uh, is one dimensional and just kind of talks about uh, basic talking points on an issue. I mean, take, take for instance, my friend, Mike Pompeo, and I both are part of the ACLJ, and we disagree on issues. And there's a thoughtful conversation. There's a thoughtful focus on, on the difference of the issues. And that's what I love about ACLJ, is you're going to get thought-provoking analysis as well as a, a serious look at the issues with lawyers who know the process, with individuals who know how to get stuff done. We come at this from a very conservative uh, arena, but even within the ideas of the conservative movement, there are differing opinions, and you're going to get those on ACLJ. Rick, as always, we appreciate you being part of our team. And, and I just want to let you know, folks, as Rick said, you know, to have Rick, to have Mike, uh, to have Tulsi Gabbard and others, it takes these financial resources. Double the impact today. ACLJ.org. Be part of our Life and Liberty Drive. We were contacted that Georgia State... Um, their final exams were going to actually coincide exactly with Passover. And so, um, you know, when you have Jewish students that are observing Passover, that is going to interfere with really the ability to prepare, study, and take final exams. And so, you know, religious accommodation needed to be had. And it was brought to our attention that this was going on, that the final exams were at the same time as Passover. And so we sent a letter to Georgia State and, you know, we pointed out the fact that this is literally the first Passover since October 7th. Yeah, since the October 7th, and this is Georgia State University, the heart of Atlanta, a uh, large Jewish community uh, right. in Atlanta. I grew up in Atlanta. So, I mean, I'm very familiar with the college. This should be something that not only is accommodated, but is prepared for in Absolutely, some ways. Absolutely, yeah. that they should be prepared for it. And, and that's yeah. really what we pointed out, again, that this is the first Passover since the horrific attacks of October 7th and that Jewish students across the country have been facing backlash and, and discrimination and protests against them. And so just reminding Georgia State that, you know, be be aware, please make sure that they know about the accommodations. Um, and we set out all the facts and we literally, our, our ask was in light of the above, we respectfully ask that you proactively address this conflict for the students and faculty by publicly acknowledging that a conflict exists and directing them to the accommodation procedure to rectify this issue. And we just received a letter. We sent this letter on Friday and we just literally just received a letter from uh, Georgia State saying, of course, they would do that. And they have sent out an email blast. Actually, they've already done that and, and told all the students 
of this conflict yeah. and how to request an accommodation. And that's why we have incredible attorneys on the ground, ready to go in all states, ready to help. Welcome back to Seculo. We are going to take your calls later on, 1-800-684-3110. You just heard from Rick Grinnell. Later on, you're going to hear from Mike Pompeo. Now we have Harry Hutchinson in the studio to keep the discussion going on the FISA bill. As we have seen sort of the chaos break out from that, you heard the uh, mistrust, the distrust of Christopher Ray earlier on. So we're going to take calls on all of those topics at 1-800-684-3110. 1-800-684-3110. Let's go ahead. Let's take a call. Sure. Let's go to Julie, who's calling in Oregon, on line three. Julie, welcome. Hi, yes, thank you, and thank you for the work that you do. I always love you guys. Um, I wanted to say that it just made my whole week, um, that comment that was so directive, I don't trust you, because the distinction that Rick Warnell made between the tool of what FISA is and the motive of a bad player, um, this was essentially – pointing out that the bad player is our own director of our own FBI and calling him on it. Yeah, um, it, with it those... is, the people that he's empowered, Julie. I mean, I'll go to Harry Hutch on this because, Harry, part of this is when you are heading up the FBI and you know you've been told time and time again about these political problems. There's reports on it that are going after churches and the, and the, the people informing you. So when you go and testify and you get up there and then say, well, this, this only went out in Richmond and it was never implemented – and then those people didn't get you all the facts. Uh, and so Christopher Ray uh, had to come back and say, well, yeah, it did actually get out all across the country. And there was even uh, a, someone put inside a church in Virginia to try and recruit uh, uh, agents and people to uh, work on this uh, and, and get testimony, get evidence that they are somehow these you know, Catholic uh, extremists. And that's just one example. But they can replace those people as, as, as director of the FBI Instead, he has allowed it to be run by the the entrenched bureaucrats who have this animosity that they now feel they can utilize the tools of law enforcement, even uh, like FISA, to target Americans and American political actors that they disagree with. You're absolutely correct. So the key question is whether or not the FBI, in their deployment of FISA or other um, initiatives, have they been trustworthy? And we have clear and unmistakable evidence that the FBI and the DOJ have engaged in dystopian abuses, which violate, at least in my opinion, the Fourth Amendment of the United States Constitution. So I think the American people are right to distrust both Christopher Wray and his staff. After all, Christopher Ray and the FBI, they've gone after traditional Catholics. They've gone after parents at school board meetings. They've gone after individuals who have purchased Bibles. They've gone after purchases of purchasers of Cabela merchandise yeah. as if somehow that's an indication of extremism. So the American people are right to distrust the FBI. And I think Jordan is on to something. One of the things that Christopher Ray can do to improve trust in the FBI is to immediately and unconditionally resign. But before doing so, he needs to remove senior staff at the FBI. Yeah, I mean, listen, he's unwilling to do you know, to remove that staff. Now, interesting enough, he could have been removed by President Biden. Uh, you serve these ten-year terms. I would imagine. Again, the, the concern will be, even if President Trump comes in, uh, depending on where his term is, which should be towards its end pretty soon, uh, that last time around when he fired an FBI director, what happened? Nothing good. He The Mueller, Mueller investigation yeah. began and then an impeachment. So there's still that concern, as yeah, we were talking about with that, Rick. There, there are ramifications to all of this. When you go through that list of, of the, the targeting that they're targeting you over, they said shopping at Cabela's or buying yeah. a Bible, it almost is like the most – liberal stereotyping of a conservative Christian. It's like that Civil War movie that came out today where it's like, look, bad people, what do they do? They buy camo, they buy Bible. They go to church. <laughs> you, know, you know, they go uh, to church. You know, they, 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 they support uh, potentially the a one of the two major parties nominated to become president of the United States. Coolers. 
I mean, it's not like they're 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 supporting you know a fourth party. It's the it's the two one it's of the two, one of major, the two major political parties. parties. How dare they? Yeah, they, they choose. But I mean, it is happening. We know that that uh, kind of targeting, and it's just like how they did uh, Harry. We've done these cases with the IRS with these kind of FBI. It's just like what they did to our clients in the Tea Party cases. These new grassroots movement that you know MAGA movement and things like that is they try to figure out they they put together be on the lookout list. And so the Bible buyers, uh, the uh, you know, with your financial traction, uh, if you bought a Trump shirt or donated, I mean, remember, they're saying, let's put that together because we believe these are people who are extremist. We have seen time and time again that they just aren't afraid enough inside the federal government to, to take these actions, which are clearly, clearly unconstitutional and outside the scope of, of even their job. No one has authorized them. To go at to go check on what Americans are buying Bibles and for that matter what Americans are buying Korans. Absolutely. So one of the other problems that Christopher Ray has with respect to his own credibility is that when he has testified before Congress, for instance, with respect to traditional Catholics, he suggested, for instance, that that uh, misconduct was limited to the Richmond office. We later learned, of course. Uh, that it had been extended to the Portland, Oregon office and the Los Angeles office. And there are probably other abuses. So the American people are right to be suspicious of Christopher Ray and his senior staff. And so I think at the end of the day, no matter how many um, uh, revisions to FISA, Congress is prepared to pass. The end of the day is whether or not those revisions, those changes in the law, will indeed be faithfully executed. Absolutely. We are at, you know, we're about to head into our second half hour. Some of the local radio stations see a lot of people calling today from radio. And if you're on radio, that's great. But some of them don't carry the full hour. If you want to also watch us, you could do that right now on ACLJ.org, our YouTube channel, or on Rumble. Just search for ACLJ. You'll find it very quickly, very easily. But we are now halfway through our Life and Liberty Drive and just three days away from everyone's favorite holiday, Tax Day, April 15th. So we're going to tie this all together because your tax deadline is just in a couple days. And right now we're pa battling the taxpayer-funded deep state. You heard me right. So you could be a part of the Life and Liberty Drive right now as we are trying to help your tax dollars. And also it's a tax-deductible gift to give to the ACLJ. Be a part of that right now. Have your tax deductible gifts doubled also during this month uh, because it's the Life and Liberty Drive. All donations are matched. You may say, how does that work? What do you mean? If I give $20, I don't want to actually be charged 40 That's not how it works. There's another great group of ACLJ supporters, ACLJ champions. Those are people that give each and every month that are there to match the funds that come in through the month of April. And, of course, during this April 15th tax deadline that's coming up, it's not fun. I know we don't like to talk about it. No one likes doing their taxes. It's. I don't think anyone look forward looks forward to this day of the year unless it's like your birthday or something. And how unfortunate. But I'd love to hear from you also as we head into the break. We got about. We have a really short break coming up, uh, less than a minute. So one 684 thirty one ten one eight hundred six eight four three one one zero. Mike Pompeo is going to be joining us just in about five minutes. So stay tuned for that. Again, give us a call. Support the work of the ACLJ, the Life and Liberty Drive. Go to aclj.org, not just to make a donation, but also just look at the incredible content that is provided for absolutely no cost. Right now, you can do that, Jordan. We'll be back with Mike Pompeo coming up in just a second. Yes, because a credible threat that Israel could be attacked by Iran as early as this evening. The ACLJ fights the battles that matter most to our members. We listen to you, and we're taking action through the ACLJ Life and Liberty Drive. Every dime we receive goes to defend life and liberty, from Capitol Hill to Geneva to the United Nations. Now is the time to fight. The rights to life and liberty are the cornerstones of our constitutional republic, but they are under attack. That is why we're proud to announce the return of the ACLJ Life and and Liberty Drive. This month, we're redoubling our efforts to beat back the radical left's attacks on your constitutional freedoms and to defend the sanctity of human life, not just here at home, but around the world. 
every gift you give will be doubled dollar for dollar, doubling your impact for life and liberty. Go to ACLJ.org right now and help us. Keeping you informed and engaged, now more than ever, this is Seculo. And now your host, Jordan Seculo. All right, folks, we've been talking a lot about FISA, and we are going to be watching as the votes come in. Now, there's a vote going on right now on the First Amendment to the, the FISA, the Section 702, which is uh, the requirement that they get a warrant first uh, before uh, warrantless wiretapping. So you get a warrant first. The, Of course, intelligence agencies are all you know, opposing this. But uh, there is a vote going on in the House. We will give you an update on whether or not the – Intelligence agencies were able to win out in convincing enough members of Congress to vote this down, or if enough members of Congress stand like we believe that this is such a mess with the FISA court that any kind of roadblocks and even small fixes is good right now until we have enough votes to really do away with it and replace it with something that that doesn't violate the constitutional rights of the American people or uh, those who choose to enter politics who might have, uh, you know, I guess just ideas that the FBI or DOJ find that they disagree with. And I uh, remember those threats from Chuck Schumer about taking on the FBI and the intelligence community. But they're supposed to be working for the, the American people and the president of the United States. Let's take the call. Yep, let's go to Jeff. Is calling California. Watch it on the ACLJ app. We appreciate Jeff, you're on the air. Thank you for producing the best um, legal and political analysis anywhere. Um, you guys are great. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you. Um, so uh, th- my question is about the Supreme Court and the Biden administration. The Supreme Court struck down Biden's um, student loan giveaway. And I understand from from news reports, which may not be accurate, that he's spent hundreds of billions or billions of dollars on um, giveaways and and yet he plans to defy the Supreme Court. How can he do that? What mechanism can he use to do that? And can they get away with it? So I'm going to go to Harry Hutchins because Harry, the way that they say that they're going about doing this is what is not again by directly trying to do what the Supreme Court said no to, but it's a, wor- a workaround. They said they're going to use existing student loan programs to cancel another round of student debt that totals 7.4 billion. For two hundred seventy uh, two hundred seventy thousand borrowers, so that they already have this money, they don't need it from Congress, and they don't need authorization. That's what Joe Biden is saying. Uh, I would argue that Joe Biden lacks the constitutional authority to unilaterally void student loan programs. Uh, that's number one. Number two, Joe Biden continues to put his thumb on the scale in order to favor upper middle class elites. Keep in mind, most Americans have not completed college. Most Americans do not have student loans. So the United States Supreme Court has ruled that prior programs are indeed unconstitutional. But nonetheless, What Joe Biden is trying to do is trying to search for programs that might allow him to get away with it, not because it's legal, but because there is no one who has legal standing to challenge this unconstitutional activity in court. You know, I do want to update you right now. The warrant requirement, like we said, uh, a small requirement doesn't alert anyone who would actually be targeted by the FISA court. That warrant requirement failed in the House of Representatives. It was a tied vote, uh, 212 to 212, which means Doesn't go through. does not go we'll, through. We'll maybe break that down coming up here in the next segment. We'll also be joined by Mike Pompeo in uh, in just a moment. So stay tuned. We'll make sure. We're, that just broke in the last few seconds. So we'll give you kind of an update of what that is and why uh, that's important to you. And, yeah, kind of a show, shows kind of a mess we're in right now. Exactly. I mean, when you've had this re- – major support for a redo of FISA, and yet each time you try to get any kind of minor any changes movement. done, it gets voted down, and not just by Democrats. Democrats couldn't have done that alone. So um, I'm even checking to see if it was all the Democrats voted on one side plus some uh, Republicans, or was it a mix? We'll get that information for you. Support the work of the ACLJ at ACLJ.org, because our team is on. I mean, the reason we're getting this info 
and we get all these breakdowns. As I'm working with a team that I was with in Washington, D.C., who are tracking all this. They're sometimes in the members' offices, you know, in the speaker's office, working, you know, alongside to try to see where these votes go. Again, it's a reason to support the work of the ACLJ on their life and liberty drive and double the impact your donation today at ACLJ.org. Well, we begin the program in the Middle East, where American diplomats and their families in Israel have been told not to travel outside of Tel Aviv, Jerusalem and Beersheba. The U.S. Embassy said it had made the order out of an abundance of caution due to fears about a possible attack by Iran. U.S. officials have been working to deter Iran from a strike on Israel with U.S. Central Command General Michael Carrilla in the region to coordinate on this threat. And Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin assuring his counterpart that Israel can count on full U.S. support to defend Israel against attacks from Iran and Israel making it clear it will hit back if there is a strike on its territory. We continue our non-stop efforts to return our our hostages, but we are also preparing for scenarios of challenges from other arenas. We establish a simple principle. Whoever hurts us, we hurt him. Intelligence sources believe Iran could launch missiles or drones, maybe both, toward Israel at any moment. In a press briefing, Israeli Defense Minister Yoav Gallant told CBN News that Israel can respond quickly and decisively to an attack, regardless of where it originates in the Middle East, including Iran. Iran has about 75 to 100 ballistic missiles that have a great enough range to uh, reach Israel. So that's a, uh, a significant threat because each one of those missiles can carry a uh, 1,000 Warhead. Does Iran attack an asset like an embassy in an Arab nation, or do they attack somewhere in Israel specific, or do they attack somewhere uh, Israeli troops in Gaza? Britain has said that it fears uh, an Iranian miscalculation could lead to war. And we, as you mentioned, the Ayatollah has threatened that Israel will be punished. We're getting some reports now that perhaps Iran's uh, response would be limited, but we'll have to wait and see. All right, welcome back to Secular. We are taking your calls to 1-800-684-3110. That's 1-800-684-3110. We're watching the FISA votes coming in on Capitol Hill, and we're going to break that down for you in the final segment of the broadcast. Right now we are joined by our Senior Counsel for Global Affairs, former Secretary of State and CIA Director uh, Mike Pompeo. And Secretary Pompeo, I wanted to go directly to this. I even got a news alert while we've been on the air uh, that uh, the situation and, and Wall Street Journal, a lot of reporting on it, that Israel could be attacked uh, even directly inside Israel or maybe uh, it, it's diplomats who serve overseas in their embassies and consulates. Uh, we've heard two days by Iran and then a, a new alert went out that it could even be occurring uh, very soon at some time this evening. Well, Jordan, I, I've seen that reporting as well. I, I can't confirm it for sure, but it's also unsurprising. The Israelis took a strike, went after a major Iranian leader, wouldn't surprise me if the Iranians decided, hey, we needed to respond in some way to placate our own domestic uh, constituency. Even they try to make sure that they are not embarrassed on the world stage. Uh, I'll be surprised if it's a strike that is uh, overwhelming or uh, creates a massive escalation cycle. The Iranians know the risk associated with that. Uh, you know, I, I was happy to see the Biden administration say that they're going to stand by our ally Israel. Uh, sadly, I think they put the Israelis in exactly this position because they had refused to say that for the past three or four months instead of constraining them. Uh, I, I'm hopeful that the Israelis will take uh, a response that is appropriate and uh, significant enough to begin to restore the deterrence that the Biden administration lost when it began to unravel the Middle East peace that had been built during the four years of the Trump administration. Yeah, I mean, Secretary Pompeo, we we heard from Prime Minister Netanyahu that Again, if if the attack comes from inside Iran, that they will respond with it, with attacks uh, inside Iran as well. So it won't be proxies. It won't be Houthis. It won't be you know uh, the, uh, the the Hezbollah. It won't be uh, you know targeted Hamas. It will be inside Iran uh, if if their attack emanates outside of Iran. Or it won't be Syria. But the the question is then, and, and I think the U.S. government, one of the advisors to the uh, president. I said, you know, of course, if they if the attack comes out of Iran, uh, I think it was a State Department official, Brett McGurk, who said if it comes out of Iran, uh, that of course they have the right to to strike back inside of Iran. I mean, if we don't deter this, and you take 
the conflict that's already going on between Israel and Hamas. And you go next level here, and I'm not saying you know the Israelis again would not. It's not. It's. I don't think they'd be uh, responsible for defending themselves. So this is really up to Iran whether they want to take a a battle that could turn into another major major conflict, even involving the United States more heavily. Jordan, I think that's that's very true. Look, this is all the doing of Iran. October 7th was the doing of Iran. Uh, the conflicts in, that, that erupt in Gaza, the terrorists that emanate from the West Bank, this is all the doing of Iran. They, they, they are the ones who have the capacity to decide, hey, this isn't worth the candle. Uh, but sadly, and, and you know this, I, I've, I've had the privilege to work alongside you and Jay and the team at ACLJ and the amazing work that you all do that give me this opportunity to, to speak to your listeners and your viewers. We all know that without a strong United States, without leadership in the White House that is prepared to convince the Iranians that the cost of their aggression, killing innocents, and we shouldn't forget, Jordan, holding Americans hostage, even as we're on this show today, we've got Americans held hostage in Gaza. I pray that they're still alive. Uh, this is the result of failed American leadership and the ability to deter Iran. So should Iran take the strike that has been reported that they're contemplating? Uh, it will require not only an Israeli response, but a response from the United States of America that demonstrates to Iran American resolve. You know, what could the U.S. do you think? Like, like I, you know, we're walking through like, to kind of deter. You know, if you, I don't, maybe you can't get specific, but basically make clear, you know, to Iran, you take these steps. Uh, we're going to be standing side beside Israel, and uh, this could be the. I mean, maybe it's strong language, but. Uh, this could be the reason why uh, your entire Islamic Republic uh, is destroyed uh, because you because of decisions like you said, uh, Secretary Pompeo, that they have decided to make, uh, that they have decided to take these aggressive steps and coordinate and fund Hamas to to uh, carry out the October 7th attacks at, at Hezbollah and in Syria and all these other areas where they try to destabilize uh, in the Gulf states as well. And there might be pretty widespread support. Uh, from those Gulf states and other other uh, major Muslim countries in that region who are also sick and tired of Iran uh, uh, supporting groups that are firing missiles into their country. Uh, I know they might not love saying it, but uh, they would be pretty supportive of saying, you know what, they've crossed a line. And uh, it, I think if, you know, if we had to hit back, and, and again, we hope we don't have to get to that point, I mean, that could be the end. I don't know how strong of a hold it is. We see the people on the streets. We see the protest uh, that that they want freedom back. Uh, but uh, so I, I guess that's why they they don't respond so quickly with attacks inside of Iran. Uh, you know, into Israel. They they are worried about their own people and what happens next. Yeah, I think that I think that's right, uh, Jordan. Uh, I'll give you. You asked sort of what are the kinds of things we could do. So obviously there are physical targets we could strike. Uh, inside of Iran, lots of different levels in the way that you could go at it. You could go at it in places that took out their capacity to ship crude oil around the world, move natural gas around the world. So you could go for infrastructure targets. There's there's lots of uh, military targets that one could go after. But put that aside for just, just a moment. Uh, think about uh, cyber efforts that could be undertaken. Think about economic sanctions that could be enforced and put in place. Uh, think about eliminating their capacity to uh, fund and train these proxies by going after the military targets, not inside of Iran, but uh, proxy headquarters and bases. Uh, the the scope and and nature of the responses are uh, highly varied. You can you can make them very nuanced. Uh, so we ought to be. I hope they've thought about that in the Biden administration. Um, we thought about it all the time. How is it that we restore that deterrence if it should be the case that we lose it? And then finally. Uh, not only is it about the the effort that's undertaken, call it a strike or a response or a, uh, how how we counter, um, but what's really important is convincing the Iranian regime that the American leadership is capable and serious and competent. And when it comes to deterrence, right, Vladimir Putin rolls into Ukraine. Uh, we lose 13 Americans in Afghanistan. Now we have the catastrophe that is the Middle East. America is a lot less secure and a lot less safe when we don't have leadership in the White House and at our security agencies that are focused on merit and on deterring the bad guys from doing dangerous things to the United States of America. You know, Secretary Pompeo, I, I, for our supporters out there, you know, I think it's key too to know uh, the reason why we're you know we're able to have you on the team, you can join us, and we can get to this level of insight with a former CIA director, a uh, former Secretary of State, to take this time to get 
deep into it, not just do these you know four minute hits, but to really explain and to and the pieces that you write also for for aclj.org. That that's because of our supporters and our donors. And uh, I just want to give you a moment too. We're in a matching um, a, a life and liberty drive right now. It's important to the ACLJ because again, it's, it's why we're able to bring on folks like you onto the team. Jordan, let me give you my personal perspective. Uh, when I was a member of Congress, I counted on the great work the ACLJ did to help me think through complex problem sets, legislative problem sets, problem sets around religious freedom, how it is the United States ought to support and defend uh, the Israelis so that they could live peacefully in their rightful Jewish homeland, uh, a broad set of litigation things that uh, Congress was trying to do. The ACLJ was always there for me and for the constituents of the 4th District of Kansas. And that takes money. It takes resources. And so I just, I frankly, I just want to say thanks to those who have contributed. I hope you'll continue to do that. Building out the capabilities of the ACLJ will absolutely protect our freedom and our liberty for years to come. Secretary Pompeo, we really appreciate you being part of the team at the ACLJ. And thank you for those kind words, too. And, and it is a long relationship. It goes back. I remember those days. Uh, when you first entered Congress, and we kind of all knew we had a sense. Uh, and again, that's not just uh, uh, just uh, me because you're part of the team. That we all have this sense it's, that this guy is going somewhere, and uh, it's great that uh, by serving in these roles, and, and I think you know in the future as well. I don't think that it's it's done, but you're able uh, to be on our team as well uh, at this yeah, time. Very it's, kind, it's Jordan. Great, bless you. Thank you, Secretary. Have a nice weekend. Yep, you too, Secretary Pompeo. Folks, we come back. We're going to get into more on what's going on with this FISA vote on, yeah. on Capitol Hill. We'll give you we'll, an update. You uh, got questions? Yeah, we'll give you an update on that so you have an understanding. I think we need to give you sort of a refresher on what happened yeah. and then what this vote means. But we are going to take as many calls as we can. And right now we got a lot of lines open because we went through so many calls earlier today. So give us a call right now. If you want to be on the air, wrap up your week with us. Come on, 1-800-684-3110, one 800 684 Three one one zero. If you have a question related to any of the topics, the FISA topics, Israel, or honestly any of the topics we've covered this week, we'd be happy to discuss them. Give us a call one eight hundred six eight four three one one zero. As we hit way halfway through our life and liberty drive, and we'll hit that halfway mark when on tax day in three days. That's right, we are just three days away from tax day, April fifteenth, and your tax deductible donations. You see that are double. That's right. Go to aclj.org. Make your donation today. Right now, our legal teams are deep fighting right now on so many issues, whether you heard about Israel, whether you heard about, uh, obviously, our our really our uh, continual struggle with the deep state and how we can support you. But also, you've heard cases of individuals throughout this country, students, so much this week. You've heard such a vast scope of what the ACLJ does. You can be a part of it today. Go to aclj.org. Make your donation, but also you need legal help. ACLJ.org slash help. Give us a call. 1-800-684-3110. Final segment coming up with you. The House once again failed to advance legislation to reauthorize a program intelligence officials say is crucial to American national security. The Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, or FISA, is set to expire April 19th if Congress doesn't move quickly. The act gives U.S. intelligence the power to collect information and communications from foreign adversaries who are outside the U.S. A small group of Republicans blocked the legislation from moving forward Thursday over concerns it doesn't go far enough to protect against collecting intelligence on U.S. citizens. What we found is uh, federal agencies are buying data that would otherwise require a warrant or subpoena. So they're basically avoiding having to get a warrant in the first place. So one of the key things for the FISA reform is getting it to the point where you have to get a warrant if you want to search American citizens' data. The FBI director went to Capitol Hill to urge lawmakers to renew the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act after Donald Trump called on them to kill it. We've seen a rogues gallery of foreign terrorist organizations calling for attacks on us. Now is not the time to take away tools that we need to punch back. It would be dangerous and put Americans 
lives at risk. This legislation, as you referenced, uh, that rule, a previous rule, was tanked earlier in the week by uh, 19 House Republicans who, again, were concerned about the legislation moving forward. Uh, but there have been some tweaks made to uh, the legislation, again, to perhaps uh, sunset this reauthorization in two years instead of five years, which as of now seems to be satisfying some House conservatives. We caught up with Texas Congressman Chip Roy a short time ago. Take a listen to what he told us. We're, we're all working in good faith to try to do it. The two-year uh, time frame is a much better landing spot because it gives us two years to see is any of this working rather than kicking it out five years. They say these reforms are going to work. Well, I guess we'll find out. All right, welcome back to Secular. We're taking your calls to 1-800-684-3110. So, uh, Section 702, the uh, FISA court, the free, uh, again, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, and specifically the provision that sets up the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, uh, which is a, a non-adversarial court. That means, again, uh, the person being targeted doesn't know. They don't have, like, an attorney there. Uh, they don't even have – we've even thought about the idea of if you, you – you know, you wouldn't want to notify a person you suspect of you know, f- foreign uh, terrorist, but – what you could have, because sometimes this involves Americans, is is a uh, like a person who is in there to just make sure that they are following the rules to get the FISA warrant. So it's basically like an attorney for a – it'd be like a John Doe. So it's not – again, you're not notifying the person they want to target, but it's an attorney who makes sure that they're following all the steps. So we talked about that as well. So there were a few amendments that went through the House of Representatives. And I'll start with, uh, we've gotten to Amendment 5 so far. Uh, four out of those five have passed, and there's one additional amendment they're voting on now. The first amendment, which was the amendment that would prohibit warrantless searches of U.S. persons' communications. So not foreigners' communications, but U.S. persons, which, by the way, you think it's, it's the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. Why would you even need a provision to protect Americans? And that got voted down and lost, 212 to 212. But it wasn't just Democrats. Uh, For instance, uh, 124 Republicans uh, and 86 uh, uh, and and 84 uh, Democrats voted yes. Is that correct? They voted. They wanted to pass it. So 84 Democrats joined. uh, uh, That that again. Let's go through this again. Well, any, can you break yeah, it down for us? Well? Yeah, we'll go, we'll go through the double one more time. Here we go. Let's post these again. Republicans 128 for the amendment, 86 against, seven did not vote. So there's some that people no showed. Right. Uh, Democrats 84 for the amendment, 126 so against. So that's how you get to 212. Yeah, and six did not vote. Yes, yeah, so the 212 to 212. And so, again, a decent amount of Democrats there joining and trying to get this passed as well. So there was bipartisan support and bipartisan opposition. It's also. Uh, sad to say because, and again, I don't think you can blame this on Mike Johnson and one Republican. There have been Republicans who have just quit. And so they're not there. Mm-hmm. And, again, one out. vote would have changed this. Now, all the other amendments so far, the uh, second. So what was am- it specifically with this amendment that why does this one is the one that doesn't have that sort of unilateral Oh, it was the one that the intelligence community didn't want the most because they like the fact to be able to do this without having to go before a judge and get a warrant. They don't want to have to prove probable cause. Yeah, they don't want to have to say uh, we actually. They just want, they want the power to spy. Right. So it's without, just power. Oh, it's power. So without uh, any oversight, and so they can start the process. Um, and again, uh, the second uh, amendment to the fight that, that, that this did pass, uh, which again it, it makes them put out reports to Congress on a quarterly basis the number of U.S. persons that the uh, uh, queries conducted. So that that's good to know. I mean, we're going to know how many more Americans are getting caught up in this process, uh, and maybe that will ultimately lead to more changes. Also, Amendment Three. This one's big, okay, because it did pass by a voice vote, uh, and it prevents the resumption of a bouts collection. So if they just want to say, you know what, we want to learn about that MAGA movement, and is there any foreign involvement there? You know, like Russia, Russia, things like yeah, that. They can just do it, and they could they could just do it that would be prohibited now. So you'd have to at least have something specific. It's not a war. Probable cause. Kind of can't just, we want to learn about something. You don't get to use uh, intelligence resources like wiretapping 
and uh, you know, uh, warrantless wiretapping and listening in on people, so tracking their their data, uh, just because you want to find out about something. So it's got to be uh, clear that number four that did pass. Uh, it tar- it actually adds international nar- narco trafficking operations to Section 702. So that I think is a positive one with fentanyl, so that they can use the law enforcement can use this to go after. Uh, those bad actors in China and in, uh, we've yeah, seen in Central America as well. The fifth one, uh, that also went through a uh, voice vote. That enables the use of Section 702 to vet foreigners traveling to the United States. So, again, uh, if there was information that was already out, uh, you could use that uh, information to make America safer. I don't see a problem there because, again, that's on foreigners. I don't know if we've got anything on the – okay, the, the Sixth Amendment passed. That remedies an intelligence loophole – that updates the definition of what an electronic communication service provider is under Section 702. So what didn't pass was we, what we thought would be the strongest provision, which was the uh, provision to get in a warrant. They continue to have the warrantless wiretapping power. Well, there's a lot going on. There's a lot of questions people have. Uh, Paul's calling from Washington. I mean, this is completely sort of off topic, but I think it's important to also know the scope of the ACLJ and exactly what's going on. But I think let's take him. Let's go to Paul, who's calling on Washington. I listen on the radio. You're on the air. Hey, Logan and the team. I appreciate the thank you, Mike Paul. My question is, what would it take to get rid of the mail-in voting, uh, which was caught the motor voter law, which was passed by, uh, what's his name, Bill Clinton? The state of Washington is allowing non-citizens to vote, and they claim to say that they're stopping it. Yeah. But I'm a mail carrier, which they uh, are uh, – I see through the mail stream how they um, – how they, you know, give it to non-citizens, and they're, they're telling me, hey, I'm not a citizen. And uh, well, Election integrity is certainly on everyone's mind right now, as we are just a few months away from the general election. But uh, a lot of those states do have sort of that they've already had on the books, even mail-in voting. Just that's part of the, the – well, Bill Clinton put it in. That's the only way to vote. Yeah, so, I mean, there are those states that exist, but uh, things can be done. We obviously are always looking into how to – to help firm that up at the ACLJ. Yeah, I mean, from one of the problems integrity. with non-citizen voting is that some major cities, blue cities, are allowing uh, non-citizens to vote in uh, local elections. Mm-hmm. So let I, I and again, if you put some local candidates on the same ballot as a presidential candidate race, I mean, yeah, there's some, a lot, there's you'd a have to really disaster. trust. You'd have to really trust the administrators of that to say, no, you only get this ballot or. Maybe in those states that you have to look at the law and say you can only have municipal races on different days so that you can't have that confusion. But, but uh, again, election integrity is still a huge issue. There has been some changes made that are positive. Uh, it's very state-specific, and there needs to be more. And the reason why I always believe there needs to be more is I don't want any American to ever think that it was wrongdoing and illegal conduct and vote rigging or anything like that that led to the candidate that you support losing. That that you trust that if you trust in our elections, that if, if a candidate wins, they're not illegitimate, <laughs> and, you, and if a candidate loses, they actually did lose the votes. And it wasn't dead people voting or non-citizens voting. And, uh, because it's dangerous to our country if that becomes the norm. You know, Stacey Abrams still not conceding. Uh, uh, the, the race in Georgia, and and so it, it's on both sides, right? It's on the, the the both sides of the aisle, and I think again, it would be nice, uh, not that they'll, that will mean that there's never a problem, but that at least you know, generally speaking, we could get back to a point where we accept the wins and the losses. If there's some legal issues, you fight those out over days, you know, even through January. Uh, but uh, right now, I know there's a serious distrust. What I can tell you is is this. If you don't vote, though, you're, you're not, it's definitely not going to get counted. So, and the candidates that you like have no chance of winning. So, don't let them deter you, because I think some of this is even pushed out by the left to deter conservatives from voting. I'm not kidding here. They think, you know, hey, we can get these people to think it's not right to vote. Support the work of the ACLJ. We work on those issues too at aclj.org.